So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, um, in this in this talk, uh, I'm going to present uh, our uh, computing paradigm towards uh, trans precision computing, uh, which is a next generation, if you like, for approximate computing. And um, if we can have a look into the next 15 years of what is coming next regarding our performance of the CPU cores, uh, the blue line here annotates, uh, highlights the, uh, the frequency, the clock CPU frequency that will be achieved up to 2033, according to the international roadmap of uh, devices and systems uh, of the previous year. So it's a very recent study. And, and the red line is uh, highlighting uh, what is the um, uh, maximum frequency that can be achieved uh, uh, regarding the power uh, density, the thermal design power, so the limits of, of the device. And you can see here that there is a big deviation, both in, in frequency and, and the throughput, so measured in teraflops per second. And, and the reason for that is that we cannot use all our transistors simultaneously because we're going to burn out our chips. So uh, this, this situation is going to be worse in the next years, eight times worse than it is today. So we have to solve this problem, and this is a nice motivation for our work. One of the, there are a lot, of, of course, of approaches out there for dealing with, with the dark silicon. This is the so-called dark silicon prob problem. One of them is to uh, fight it with approximate computing. So this is just an outline of the presentation. I'm just referring to the trans-precision computing paradigm. Uh, I will provide uh, an overview of the project that it is an initiative to, uh, to come up uh, to a solution to this problem. And uh, I will speak about our first uh, system targeting high-performance computing uh, and uh, being trans-precision ready. Uh, I will conclude with some results that we have, especially for the FPGA part, because the project is generic, uh, it is covering a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm going to refer to the FPGA implementation that we have uh, in, in the context of this, uh, of this session today, and leaving some conclusions at the end. So approximate computing so far, uh, if we do want um, to uh, highlight uh, the precision, um, the computational progress, so let's take a very uh, basic example, the computational progress uh, on, uh, on the x-axis and, and the, pre the precision on the, on the uh, y. So traditional computing means that uh, all of our devices now are using floating po point data types or double float or integers or uh, a fixed amount of precision, okay? And uh, up to the start of the application, up to the end. So the idea of approximate computing introduced some years ago was to use some other data types or lesser or formats with lesser a little bit less bits to represent the information and this allowed for a very big gains in the energy efficiency because both for storing less uh, data types with less bits and process them is allowing a lot of space for energy uh, savings both so energy gains uh, gains come also from uh, from the fact that you have less precision but also you can, when you have a less precision, you can uh, have the uh, computational progress uh, so the part of the calculation can be uh, calculated faster. Now, uh, uh, the trans-precision computing uh, is leveraging approximate computing to another level that allows us to uh, fine-grain um, uh, tune our algorithm and the precision and this allows for better gains across the computational progress. So the idea is that to find what is the least amount of, of precision that I can keep at every part of the calculation to deal with better energy efficiency and, and deliver better energy efficiency results. So we have special features that we are introducing with transprecision, adaptive uh, precision calibration, uh, recovery accuracy by the end of the calculation, and adaptive stopping criteria. Uh, these features are nice, but how can we implement them onto a high-performance computing system. But let me first uh, uh, speak a little bit about the project. So the project that I'm referring to is the OPERCOM. Uh, it is a European Union funded project uh, with a four years uh, milestones. Uh, now we're running the second year of the project. And the idea is that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we aim to introduce a new framework for computing, trans-precision computing, with which provides flexible precision, adequate accuracy, uh, algorithmic innovation and scalable, uh, low-power, uh, reliable computations. The aim of the project is that we'll try to 
uh, built two vehicles to study the precision, both at energy neutral computational sensing, so at the milliwatt space and targeting IoT devices, up to uh, the high performance computing and uh, so to, to prove that it is doable to build trans-precision computing for sustainable high performance computing devices. And, um, uh, and OPERCOM is trying to provide a, a, a nice scaling for all these options, from milliwatt to megawatt, spanning nine orders of magnitude. Uh, so, uh, wh how we build this? Of course, uh, this uh, innovation cannot start only by providing a library or by providing a specific architecture, by but by revisiting the complete computing stack, starting from the physical foundations and the mathematical theory, <laughs> where the University of Perugia, for instance, our colleagues there are developing methods that can guarantee which is the least amount of energy that we have to keep in our memory cells so that they are not flipping. And uh, they're creating their models, and these models are annotated to the other layers. You can see here the disruptive technology, mo modeling techniques, architecture, uh, software, environment, compilers, algorithms. And on top of that, we are evaluating our system with three different uh, ca categories of applications. High performance computing, big data, and deep learning. Uh, we are building two systems, the milliwatt, as I said before, targeting IoT devices and the kilowatt domain for the, for the high performance computing and um, uh, for instance we if we take uh, this this level over here the disruptive technology modeling and exploration layer uh, uh, we're developing several uh, simulators that can take uh, physical model and limitations coming from the physical foundations and annotate them with uh, with some simulators to explore what is the best memory hierarchies, for instance, heterogeneous 3D stacks, new technologies, RERAM, NEMS devices, and what is the best option to deal uh, so they provide a kind of design space exploration between the energy and the energy models coming from, from, from the physical foundations, uh, so to build a, a memory device. For instance, this is uh, a typical example that uh, we, we have a simulator based on System C, which is coupling our base system, which is the PALP, I will refer to this in the next slides, uh, and, and several uh, DRAM simulators. Uh, this allows to build memory devices with uh, tunable uh, precision. Now our basic architecture is depicted on this slide. So, uh, okay, it's a lot of information here, but the basic idea is that our uh, Anchor device is, is, is the PALP system. PALP is a uh, an open source uh, initiative uh, from University uh, of Bologna and ETH in Zurich, the University uh, of Zurich. And uh, uh, the PALP subsystem is, uh, the architecture of PALP subsystem is this one. So it is a, 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 a cluster of RISC V cores. So the architecture here is RISC V. And uh, we can have many clusters on, on a single pal PALP subsystem. So all these clusters or the processors here are interconnected through um, a very tightly integrated logic, uh, the logarithmic interconnect right here, to a very low power memory. And, and we have here a lot of channels. So all of these RISC uh, risk v cores can communicate between each other through this uh, logarithmic interconnect to a small scratchpad memory. Uh, we have a lot of channels over here. And the idea is that our PALP subsystem is, uh, which is supporting uh, different ways of introducing the transprecision. I will refer to these techniques. How do we implement transprecision on to the PALP subsystem and on to this course over here? And we couple this processor to an HPC node, Power 8 and Power 9, uh, through the copy link. Okay? Um, the idea of this is that we're going to pr prove that we can build such a system and offload parts of the calculations that can be speed up and at the same time uh, keep a very low power profile because of this transprecision. So parts of the calculations are being offloaded to the PALP subsystem, which is providing options for playing with the precision. Now, of course, to make it usable, you need the appropriate tools. It's not about architecture, it's not about uh, different other uh, uh, architecture techniques or something, but you have to provide the tools. And uh, we have uh, a complete um, 
uh, other colleagues that are working on how to introduce this uh, trans-precision concept. And um, uh, here you can see, for instance, our programming uh, environment, which is based on Pragma-based directives. Uh, software developers are very familiar with this kind of programming. Uh, you can insert uh, through a Pragma uh, uh, directive, as, as you can see here, the variables and the precision that you will need to keep at the iterations that will follow for a specific part of the calculate of, of your of your program, and then uh, uh, automatically the compiler will uh, from the front end. So here is the front end, and in the middle end and the back end we have the appropriate tools to uh, to tune our precision on the calculations, and of course map them uh, to a specific developed instruction set that is supporting low precision uh, calculations. Okay, so this is under development. We have a first version of our tool flow up to now, but, but this is something that uh, currently is, is under development. Uh, so the idea of, of having different types of precision, uh, you can see that today we have a float. Uh, every programmer is, is familiar with a float, but float is providing 32, is, is keeping 32 bits of information on, on the memory. And the idea is that we have a lot of workloads that can be, uh, can we, we can gain a lot of energy and memory footprint by uh, using uh, other data types with low, uh, with a little bit less bits uh, for Mantis and the exponent. You don't need all these, uh, all these bits for some specific workloads. And here is a, 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 a library that we're developing, the Flowtext library, that, uh, so here is a small, example of how can you transfer one program uh, uh, with floating point data type, just a small snippet of code to understand, to a trans-precision one. So here you can have your Floatex library, which is just a, a header library uh, in C++, and provide the classes for doing all the uh, transformation from uh, floating point 32 to any arbitrary precision floating point data type. Arbitrary precision of Mantis and exponent, okay? So uh, how we extend um, the power processor to be coupled with a pulp subsystem uh, is, is highlighted on this, on this architecture. So you can see uh, we are uh, connected it through a copy and uh, the PSL on the FPGA devices is uh, connected to a PSL to access stream. Uh, the complete pulp subsystem is, uh, is based on access streams and uh, is axi-based, and uh, here is how we can offload part and data from the power side to the pulp side, to be consumed by the pulp processors. Uh, now, the pulp is coming in two flavors. We have both the RTL, it's open source, and also uh, we have a virtual platform for pulp developed in System C, so that people can take the virtual platform and develop transprecision code just with a virtual platform, without even having access to a real pulp design, okay? And uh, pulp is a project that is uh, really, uh, um, it has a very big momentum right now and uh, you can find more information here. So this is a spoiler alert and uh, uh, you can find there is already silicon proven technology. Uh, a lot of uh, around 20 pulp uh, designs are already taped out uh, for different workloads, bioinformatics, neural networks. So there is a lot of customization options for developing uh, and playing with, with this processor. Uh, now, what are the options to introduce the transprecision on, 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 uh, on this pulp core? There are a lot of options. One of them is to extend the instruction set of the RISC and to provide some auxiliary processing unit extensions on, on, a, on the ISA. Uh, one other option is to provide a third APU so sometimes you don't want to reserve so much space for every one of these cores, but a third AFU among, uh, among other cores. Or sometimes you can have an accelerator attached to uh, the logarithmic interconnect directly. So the way uh, and the granularity that you can add transprecision accelerator is based on your needs. But we have the options to, and, and we have already uh, designed this, this kind of, of cores and accelerators. Um, for instance, one example, of, of, of this uh, third APU is, uh, is this one, is a small floating point unit implementing all these different formats. Okay, this is the one, the IEEE as we know it, and uh, with uh, 23 bits of Mantis and 8 bits of exponent, but uh, this small floating point unit is also supporting 
um, uh, the, the official IEEE uh, 16 with 10 bits of exponent and 5 bits of Mantisa and this one which is uh, an alternative format for 16 bits with 7 bits of, of Mantisa and 8 bits of, of, of exponent. Effectively, this binary, this alternative format can support the same dynamic range as a typical floating point dat uh, data type, but still maintaining uh, half of, of the space for the memory and the as well as the processing uh, necessities. So also we have implemented an 8-bit um, uh, expo um, uh, data type and we have created this small, small floating point unit. Uh, we have taped out uh, ETH uh, people from, from ETH, our colleagues have taped out this, uh, this uh, um, in 65 nanometers technology working already. And they've proved that uh, this is something really, really meaningful. It saves a lot of energy uh, for the computations. Um, now, uh, our part is related to uh, and the work that we're doing right now, uh, we have already uh, co uh, completed actually this work, is how to connect the power to, uh, to this subsystem of pulp uh, cores. And we do it through an copy to axi adapter that we've designed and um, uh, we're creating a, uh, we are using copies, uh, work element descriptor, FIFO to connect uh, our PSL to, to the interconnect of the pulp. Um, here is the memory map. How do we map our Power8 memory to our 32-bit uh, uh, pulp de de uh, de uh, devices? Uh, you can see that we are power is using uh, only the lower 48 bits of the address. So pulp it's itself, right now, we are using a version of pulp that is 32 bits, but also uh, the pulp team has uh, released the next 64-bit uh, uh, processor as well. Uh, we selectively extend the system level interconnects to 49 bits and we can leave, we can use this space actually for other devices like other memories, DRAM memories. Now up to now it's unused but this is how now uh, we have mapped the complete system uh, and having our memory map. Um, uh, so how pulp is booting? I'm just showing an example of uh, how we've made this work and having a, a f our first prototype. So first of all, uh, you can see here uh, what is happening on the Power8 and what is happening on the FPGA side. Uh, so uh, what we could do was to uh, load the binary of the pulp, so the execution, uh, the code of the par pulp, onto and attach it to the, uh, let's say, to the bitstream of the FPGA. But this does not make any sense because every, every time that you had to, to change your code, you have to generate a new bitstream or something. So it would be really, really not very meaningful. So what we did was to implement a small bootloader onto the FPGA side. So we've implemented the bootloader uh, uh, again with, uh, uh, with, uh, with our design of the pulp. And then every time uh, we, par we, we, we send the binary over a work element descriptor or work element descriptor from pulp to the pulp cores inside the FPGA. Uh, effectively, this is how it is done, just a simple uh, sample of code. So we have the source address and the de destination address, and uh, we are parsing the ELF header and the program headers, and then we are creating our work ele element descriptor and we are just passing them through uh, through copy. Um, so this is how it is done. Uh, in order to make our life a little bit easier, we've created a wrapper on top of libcxl, which is another wrapper of cxl. And uh, this is the basic routines that someone can use and directly uh, open a connection to the pulp course and transfer them the program. So it's just a couple of libraries that are using libcxl libraries and then we can you can map programs from your host side to, to the pulp very easily. So this is just how, how a typical hello world program looks like. So you are creating a binary hello world and then you are creating a kernel, you are opening a device, you are attaching a work element descriptor to an address and then uh, you send the uh, binary to this uh, work element descriptor and then everything has been transferred on the top of pulp and pulp can boot the hello world program. Okay. Uh, so to to offer our services, because okay, we've built an HPC system, but uh, how 
can other people can access the system and how can uh, be useful for a community uh, or if you like uh, for the high performance computing domain uh, we have coupled the technology that we're developing on Opercom with uh, system services that are provided by Open Power Consortium, like uh, high performance computing devices, uh, P8 and P9 nodes, and, uh, and cloud computing, uh, so the super vessel uh, cloud computing environment. And we have created uh, a, a, a number of different, let's say, uh, software development kits. So we have a software development kit which is providing. Uh, uh, all the software and the libraries needed to uh, create transprecision programs as the Flowtex library that I referred previously. Uh, we have a cloud development kit that allows a user to create an instance with a Power8 node attached to an FPGA over the cloud. So you don't have to uh, do it on your own. You get an instance, a Docker image attached to, a, to an FPGA device uh, programmed with a copy and, and the pulp cores and uh, then you can start developing quickly your program. And, and uh, as well, we have a hardware development kit, which is all the scripts and all the stuff needed to uh, bundle uh, the pulp core with the copy interfaces and create a bitstream for the FPGA devices. Here's so these are three main libraries that you can, uh, you can have and, and, and launch your, your instance on, on this node. Okay. Uh, the first version of our system was based on Power8 Minsky node uh, attached to a, a copy one link and uh, we have tested uh, two devices, uh, the KU3 from Alpha Data, both of them, uh, the KU3 and the 8KU. Uh, so we have managed to map uh, four clusters, part of the clusters, every cluster has two cores and uh, so eight cores in general and four, four cores, two clusters uh, for the KU3 device. Uh, on, on our, at our premises in Zurich Lab, uh, we have uh, this card over here, but our colleagues uh, in uh, ETH and Queen University of Belfast, they are working with, uh, with 8KU devices. Uh, our second version that we are uh, currently um, uh, working on is uh, the Witherspoon machines with uh, a Copy2 and OpenCopy3 uh, interfaces uh, with a 9v3 card. So this is just a picture from the previous week that we've uh, just connected uh, the, the open copy link but not uh, going further. So this is uh, our uh, homework for, that for, for the next week. And um, uh, so this is it. And of course, uh, ah yes, and this is that we have the adapters here. You can see that we have to, uh, we didn't even connect it right well. So we have to uh, do some hard hard work to, to make the connector working. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this is how we've, uh, we've in general, we are creating uh, transprecision programs, but there is the option to attach other accelerators. I mean, transprecision accelerators, but not developed on the software side. You can directly program them on the hardware side. And this is how we are using CapiSnap for that. Uh, so this is an overview, it has a lot of information here, but this is an overview of how can you, how we extended CapiSnap to support transprecision um, uh, development. So uh, different precision on top of CapiSnap. And um, so we have on the host side, the data format controller, all the extensions for Snap are highlighted with this uh, Kian color. And we have a data format controller taking control of how can you change the format on the host side. So it's a kind of casting mechanisms on the host side and some runtime re registers on the FPGA side that are uh, on top of MMIO space. And uh, we have also provided some customized uh, fixed point libraries and approximate approximation uh, functions libraries. For instance, we have approximated uh, some mathematical functions like um, uh, hypertangular tagnant and um, um and um, uh, sigmoid functions for neural networks. Um, this is one a result of developing an accelerator with copy snap and, and different precision. So instead of keeping uh, 32 bits for all this calculation step, it is uh, actually an OCR tool, a tool that is scanning uh, images stored on your disk and uh, uh, is reconstructing the text. Uh, so the algorithm, uh, we took this BLSTM algorithm, which stands for bilinear, bidirectional, long short-term memory uh, neural network. 
it is a memory bound uh, application and okay you, you have to in general you have to solve all these equations but the concept is that you don't need to keep the same precision for all of these equations here and what we can do is to um, make a fine grain uh, calculation of what is the least amount of bits that I have to need in every part of this calculation. So you here you can see the copy snap environment, uh, the power memory that everything is, is stored on typical uh, floating point uh, format or uh, whatever. And then uh, it is transferred onto the FPGA and then different engines of different precision are calculating these uh, equations over here. Uh, this allows, for instance, here you can see the accuracy from 0 to 100, and this is only for one layer of the calculations, for one part of the calculations. You, you can see the, the yellow color is, I know, is highlighting the 100% of accuracy, so you can see that you can really traverse and go down to a little less bits of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of processing uh, without even uh, with, with sacrificing just 0.01% of the, of the final accuracy. So it makes sense a lot for the FPGA side to, uh, to, uh, to manipulate and find the least amount of precision that you can keep. So this is some results of, of the CapiSnap uh, accelerator for, for this neural network. You can see here the CPU uh, time and here uh, the FPGA time uh, that we've managed to, uh, to succeed. Uh, we've managed to create up to four accelerators for the KU3 device. Uh, we've reached the memory uh, limit of, of this device. And okay, this is some more detailed results, but the key message uh, is that uh, uh, here you can see the accelerators and the floor plan when mapped to the FPGA. And we've reached the 96% of the memories. You can see here all the uh, memories being consumed. Uh, we've managed to succeed in 22 fold energy efficiency compared to CPU uh, using all threads as I showed, sorry, uh, here. You can see that after uh, from 16 to 32 threads, uh, it started to starvate cannot succeed better speed up than that while FPGAs can linearly be scaled but we couldn't uh, load them uh, because of the memory limit uh, now we're uh, gonna map this to other devices bigger devices and uh, uh, this is also a floor plan for our pulp clusters you can see again the copy and uh, so this is a different design for pulp clusters uh, mapped onto the uh, 8k5 device with four clusters um, so Okay, this is what I wanted to share with you. And uh, so just a takeaway message. Um, uh, for so for the summit, I uh, would like to, to, to state that we are developing throughout this uh, project uh, a full transprecision framework for future technologies. And uh, we aim to, uh, to provide and uh, build the first transprecision computing community. Uh, we have a lot in the pipeline like uh, compiler support for Transprecision pragmas, as I said, uh, we're leveraging open copy for our next version of, of the uh, kilowatt pilot platform. Uh, we have up to now, uh, our colleagues are working on 12 different kernels from big data, HPC, and deep learning, uh, mapping all these uh, kernels to transprecision software uh, on top of our hardware. And uh, we have up to now full support for different formats of floating point, and uh, there is another other parts that I didn't even describe at all because of of, uh, of, um, of the session and the time, but uh, for instance, DRAM controllers and other stuff, memories and other uh, exotic memories rather than DRAM uh, that we're working on. Uh, so please, uh, uh, if there is some ideas that you can you would like to discuss, uh, we will be very happy to to collaborate. And uh, here is the site of, of the project, and we have started to push uh, code. Every, every code that is developed on under our project is shared uh, under the Apache uh, license, so it is uh, already some first stable version of our software is, is pushed onto the GitHub. So this, uh, there are a lot of people, of course, working from different domains uh, and different expertise is, is, uh, um, uh, is coming from. So uh, IBM Research, um, uh, we're uh, coordinating the activity, but uh, there are a lot of experts from different domains, as I said before. So thanks a lot for your, uh, for your attention, and I know that I'm between uh, I'm in the, the last session, so uh, uh, thanks a lot again, and uh, yep.